thanks so much for the introduction. Um, so we've got about uh, 20 minutes together this evening. Thanks for joining me, uh, despite the sunny weather here in, in England. Um, so we're going to go over some things um, to do with ACL uh, rupture management and rehab. So I'm an NIHR Health Education uh, England Clinical Doctoral Research Fellow and a cl Clinical Specialist Physio at the University Hospitals of Derby and Burton. I've had various funding for the work that I'll be presenting this evening, including an NIHR and Health Education England internship, pre-doctoral bridging fellowship, and my current funding um, on a clinical doctoral research fellowship. Um, so as I'm sure we're all aware, ACL ruptures are the most common knee injury, uh, but there's a few other facts just to get brains ticking that I'd like uh, your responses to. So hopefully Tony's going to pop a poll um, for you to vote on, which will hopefully start with an easy question first off, um, which is question one. So from the structure on your screen, uh, is the ACL the red or the green structure? Um, and I don't think I can see the polls, so I'm not sure I'll be able to see when everyone's voted. Let me just have a quick fiddle with my screen. OK, grand, I've got them. Uh, Tony, have you released the first one? Yes, you have. I can see some results coming through. OK, good. Give you a little bit more time. We're here into 50-50. I probably should have said that this is a posterior view of the knee if you haven't already clocked it, which might give you an extra little clue. Nice. OK, so I've got lots of votes coming in. So um, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to move on. Um, but it is the red structure um, on this page. So um, Moving on to question two, thinking about approximately how many ruptures uh, there are each year in the UK. Um, you should have question two now appear on your screen. So yeah, votes are pretty split at this point. Um, can get your clicks in as soon as possible. That would be grand. Okay, no more are populating on my screen, so I'm gonna put the answer on. So it's 20,000 approximately ACL ruptures uh, here in the UK. Question three, which should hopefully be released to you now. Uh, I want to know again, approximately how much do ACL ruptures cost the NHS each year? So lots of votes for 47, uh, some for 95, some for 63, yeah, grand. Other votes are whizzing in. Thanks, everyone. That's great. Yeah, it is um, 63 million. However, I will let you off if you put 88 um, as the figures are estimated and the last data we've got is from 2015, which estimates they cost upwards of 63 million uh, with the upper limit around 85. So um, it's likely to have increased in 2023. And then final question for now uh, is question number four. Um, and I want to know is how much is ACL surgery grown? So between uh, 1997 and 2017, the reported number of ACL uh, surgeries has increased by how much? Do you think it's fivefold, sevenfold, tenfold, or twelvefold? Looking in favour of tenfold at the moment. Um, thanks everyone for your votes. Very much appreciated. It is twelvefold. Um, so moving on to a few more quiz questions then. Um, lovely. So um, hopefully brain's a little bit more warmed up. So as we know, a large proportion of patients proceed with surgery after an ACL rupture because they want to get back to their pre-injury level of physical activity. Now, this outcome is reported in quite a variety in the literature in the form of return to sport, return to performance, return to pre-injury activity level. And it's also sometimes extrapolated from quantitative measures such as the coups. Um, so it can be quite difficult to determine the return rate and um, given it's reported against several different measures. So first question uh, that I want to know is how many patients do we think expect to return to their pre-injury level after surgery? Do we think it's 57 to 60 percent? 75 to 77, 80 to 83, or 88 to 91. Votes are whizzing in. Thanks so much, everyone, for participating. Very helpful. Um, so a bit of split between 1883 and 1891, and that might be because they're quite close together. But the answer is 88 to 91%. And that was from some research um, of cohort data collected from Germany and Australia. So a good chunk of people expect to be able to return after they've had surgery. 
So how much are these expectations met? So uh, the following four questions are reported statistics from research studies that have been done over the years. The first is the earliest, so a 2014 systematic review that reported a return to sport rate following primary and revision ACL surgery, which also included some repairs, um, an average follow-up of 40 months after surgery. So the next question that I want to know is how many do you think uh, returned to sport at that time? Was it 55%, 65, uh, 75 or 85? Okay, good. Relatively even split in favour of maybe 65. Good. Keep the votes coming in. Good. OK, so the results have just disappeared off my screen, so I can't see what the favoured uh, response was, but the response is uh, the answer is 55 percent. So that's for return to sport data. Now, the next three um, statistics are looking at return to pre-injury levels. So what I want to know is what percentage do we think have returned at one year to their pre-injury level of activity? Um, is it 13 percent, 24 percent, 35 percent or 46 percent? Nice, lovely folks pouring in. So favours at 24 at the moment. All 24 and 35 are cutting it even. And the results have disappeared. So apologies if we didn't get a chance to vote on that one, but um, it's 24%. And then if we think about uh, 18 months, how many do we think have returned at that time? So the next question should be on your screen um, for 28%, 34%, 41% or 49%. Okay, good. Lovely, so they're coming in equal around 34 and 41. Thanks for voting, everyone. It's actually 28%. And then final question um, for now, at two years, do we think less than 30% have returned, less than 45, less than 57, or less than 65% uh, have returned to their pre-injury level after two years? So the next question should be on your screen. I actually can't see this one, Tony. So... Um, Apologies, I don't know whether it's not come up or oh, now that incorrect questions popped up. So if you could go back one, that would be grand. And now they've disappeared altogether. So I'm going to move on in the interest of time, um, but it was less than 45%. So despite patients expecting to return, a large proportion struggle to do so, even two years after surgery and, and 40 months down the line. So thanks everyone uh, for voting. For now, we've got a few more questions later on. So um, I started to look at these outcomes and think about how we might be able to improve them. So there's a 2019 narrative review on ACL rupture recommendations uh, that recommends prehabilitation starting as soon as possible after diagnosis to improve post-operative outcomes. And this is also endorsed by some UK guidelines developed by Basque, Boston and BOA. The recommendations make vague suggestions of improving muscle strength, reducing swelling and regaining range of movement, but there isn't much evidence to back these statements up. Other published recommendations also suggest the function of prehab to mentally prepare patients for surgery, but again this is quite vague and there's no evidence as to what that specifically means and how we go about doing it or what benefit it has. And given the waiting period is now over a year for ACL surgery in the UK, it seemed baffling to me that we didn't really know how to best support these patients during this time and was something that I questioned as, as a clinician. So I wondered if there was anything that we could do prior to surgery that might improve these outcomes and help patients return to their pre-injury activity levels. Because in other orthopaedic conditions, prehab has been cited to offer a number of benefits, such as improving functional recovery, fear avoidance beliefs, satisfaction, um, overall outcomes and mental preparation, whilst also reducing length of stay and complication rates. So there's two papers on the screen, uh, which are from my internship, uh, where I started my research journey, which I'm going to briefly run through with you now. So the systematic review uh, we completed and published in 2020, and we were looking at the effectiveness of prehabilitation programmes on post-operative outcomes. We included three randomised controlled trials, um, and all those trials uh, incorporated an exercise programme as their prehab intervention. We completed a risk of bias assessment, and all three papers scored as high risk of bias. And we also completed a grade assessment to determine the quality of each outcome, which were all scored as very low. Statistical significance was found for quadriceps strength and single leg hop scores in favour of prehab at three months after an ACL reconstruction. 
But some things to think about with these results is that obviously quadriceps strength and single leg hop scores are only two of many variables. Three months follow up isn't very long, especially given that we've just looked at some statistics of people who are still struggling to return to their pre-injury level at one, one and a half and two years after surgery. Some other results from this review were that there was no statistical significance, um, significant differences, sorry, between those who had prehab and those who didn't for pain and function. There was no evaluation against psychological outcomes, which is known to be an important factor in patients following ACL rupture. And there was no consensus still on what a prehab program should look like. So with no consensus in the studies in the literature, we also completed a cross-section online survey to understand what clinical practice might look like. So we got 122 complete responses uh, from physiotherapists across 20 different countries um, in three different settings, and responses were most prevalent in the UK, US, and in Australia. Um, so there are a number of questions in the survey, which I won't go through all of them now, um, and the supplementary material on, of the paper includes all of those questions, um, but just a snapshot of the results. So it was found that most physios would prescribe exercise and offer advice and education to patients uh, waiting for ACL surgery. About 40% would offer passive treatments such as manual therapy, bracing or taping, and there was no consensus on the frequency and length of treatment. It was also reported that 84.4% of clinicians felt that many patients did not receive prehab where they worked, and the predominant reason for that was a lack of referral for it. So I then wondered if there was anything that we could look for and change before surgery that might improve someone's chances of returning to physical activity after ACL reconstruction. So we did a review looking for modifiable preoperative predictors of a successful outcome of returning to physical activity after surgery. So there was eight studies in this review. Uh, there was five different measures for returning to physical activity at a range of time points from uh, one to 10 years post-surgery. So this goes back to my earlier point about reporting return rate in the literature. So we didn't restrict based on a uh, measure and time frame for that reason. And we found that four modifiable factors um, were predictive and they were quadriceps strength, psychological profile, the patient's estimated ability to return, and bone patella tendon bone graft. So essentially, the review concluded that these four factors were associated with returning to physical activity or sport after ACL reconstruction. And so considering addressing these before surgery could be a sensible place to start. Um, now, before we move on to my current programme of work as part of my PhD, I just wanted to do a mini quiz to round off that previous research, which I appreciate was a whistle-stop tour. Um, so hopefully, if you release the next poll question, um, Tony, what I'm looking for in this question is, um, in the systematic review, looking at effectiveness of prehab programmes on post-op outcomes, what, in addition to quadriceps strength, was found to have improved three months after surgery in those who had prehab? Um, and the poll just seems to have completely disappeared for me, despite me press, pressing the button. So I'm going to give you a few minutes and then I'm going to give you the answer because I can't see it. So apologies for that. Um, so for the systematic review, then it was quadriceps strength and single leg hop scores. And then if you release the next question, Tony, um, for the survey of physio practice, what I want to know is what would most clinicians do? Is it offer exercise advice and education? Do some sort of bracing or taping or manual therapy and electrotherapy? Oh, this one's popped up for me and nice to see that the overwhelming response is exercise, advice and education, as that is the correct answer. And then final question for now. Um, there were four preoperative factors in our review of predicting returning to physical activity after ACL reconstruction. Um, there were quadriceps strength, bone patella tendon, bone graft, psychological profile and what other factor? Good. Again, overwhelming response is coming through for patient estimated ability to return, which is the right answer. So thanks very much, everyone. Um, so moving on to my current programme of work then. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is funded by the NIHR and my research is split into three different phases. And we are aiming to develop an intervention for use of patients after ACL injury before potential surgery. So the first phase was qualitative interviews with patients on the ACL surgical pathway. Um, and we interviewed them both pre-op and post-op. The second phase, uh, which we're just finishing off now, was developing an intervention with patients and key stakeholders. And then finally, we'll move on to testing the intervention in clinical practice next year. We've got a website that you can keep up to date with progress of the study, and you can also follow us and me on Twitter or X, as it's now known. 
So phase one, we interviewed 18 participants, 10 were pre-surgery, six were three months post-surgery and two were one year post-surgery. The median age of participants was 29, which sort of aligns with the average age in the literature um, and aligns with the UK National Ligament Registry um, average age of surgery. Only three participants were female, which again fits with the UK National Ligament Registry that surgery is more common um, in males in the UK. And there is limited data in the literature on racial and ethnic predispositions to ACL injury. So although the aim of qualitative research isn't to be fully representative of the population in question, it is important for us to capture diversity. So we collected ethnic origin and 14 participants described their origin as white, um, one of which also described themselves as Lithuanian, two as Indian, one British Asian and one Pakistani. So follow analysis of the interview transcripts, we organised the findings into five themes. So I'm going to give you a whistle-stop tour through these five themes, um, giving you a quote from each of the participants to demonstrate the types of things um, that participants in the study were saying. So theme one is all about patients' experience of injury in their knee, being diagnosed with an ACL rupture, their beliefs and knowledge of the injury, its impact upon them, and their journey um, to gain and support to deal with injury consequences. So one participant described here really struggling post-injury, struggling with their mental health and not wanting to go to work or get out of bed. Uh, next is theme two, which describes participants' experiences of navigating the treatment pathway, um, which also includes um, how they communicate with healthcare professionals along the way. The collective stories describe treatment feeling rigid at times, um, with this idea of just moving along a conveyor belt. So a participant here describing to feel like you're going through the motions. Theme three is about sense making in the preoperative uh, period and reflects on the preoperative journey and describing participants' experiences and understanding of this stage of treatment. Um, and there was in this area, there was quite a lot of uncertainty and unanswered questions. So a quote from the participant here explaining to feel like they're on a pendulum between um, wanting the operation, not wanting it, despite already being on the waiting list for ACL reconstruction and intending to go through with surgery. Theme four organises around the post-operative period. It describes participants' experiences of this time, making sense of surgery and returning to physical activity and work. And the quote here describes the difficulties of the early post-operative period where you've had surgery, you're in pain and you're on your own with a booklet of exercises and some information. And they go on to talk about how difficult that was. And then finally, theme five accounts participants' experiences of utilising available resources, gaining advice and dealing with others' opinions, which was typically pretty challenging. So the quote here was a participant describing their thought processes and difficulties, um, having had differing advice about surgery from the physio and the orthopaedic consultant, and not knowing whose advice to believe and who to go with and, and what to do. So very speedy overview of the five themes, which I appreciate. The paper um, is currently under review. Um, and I appreciate it was a bit of a whistle stop tour. So some key messages um, that were take home from phase one are that guidance on how to manage the condition whilst awaiting surgery was, was limited as one of the descriptions of participants. There was a lack of reliable resources that offered um, consistent information about the condition and its treatment. Prevalitation was valued by patients and felt to offer uh, multiple advantages in terms of speed of recovery, mental well-being, returning to physical activity, and also to support with decision making. However, specificity of prehabilitation was really important and where standard generic information exercises were given, participants deemed this as quite low value, which resulted unfortunately in limited engagement. Healthcare advice, particularly before surgery, lacked consistency and participants gained advice from a wide range of people, such as friends and family, GPs, physios, surgeons, multiple surgeons. Standardised information was not well received amongst this population and communications with and between healthcare professionals was tricky, with uh, patients describing difficulty accessing clinicians, having limited time during appointments, and also frustration during appointments with having to repeat their history, um, as this made them feel as though healthcare professionals weren't talking to each other, which made care feel quite, which made care feel quite disjointed, and participants felt there was a lack of support with decision making, and there was limited descriptions of shared decision making practices. So in terms of decision making, participants kind of sat in one of these three categories where they either wanted a recommendation from a healthcare professional to support their decision, which they didn't feel like they got. Others wanted absolving of any responsibility and wanted to be told what to do. And others felt there was no decision presented to them as they were told you either have the surgery or choose not to engage in physical activity again. And so didn't feel that that was a decision to them. 
On the slide is a quote from NICE, um, which is the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence, about shared decision making, which essentially highlights that it's clinicians and patients working together using individual preferences and the evidence base. And NHS England also recognised this as a key factor to personalised care. And so one of the key take home messages from phase one was that shared decision making with ACL patients could be better. And currently there's limited support of how best to do that. So to wrap all this up then, um, briefly to give you an overview of phase two, we carried that information into a um, consensus study to develop an intervention that addresses those issues. Um, and we've done that through a nominal group technique. So we're just finishing this phase off, but essentially it was held um, with patients, physios, an occupational therapist, surgeon and therapy manager, and some non-voting uh, facilitators to support the conversation, which was made up of experts in the research method, ACL research, and also some patient representatives that are part of the wider patient and public involvement group. And we're pulling these results together. Um, but the intervention is shaping up to be around shared decision making to support patients in deciding on treatment for their ACL rupture, um, in addition to some recommendations for treatment after an ACL injury and before surgery. Um, so that's where we're up to. Thank you very much for listening. And um, please do get in touch with me if you want to chat further. And happy to take any questions after Gianti's presentation. Thanks very much. Thanks so much for your presentation, um, Hayley. Um, just due to circumstances, JH3 isn't going to join us this evening with her presentation, but she um, is going to send us all a recording, which will be available on our website. So what I thought I would do is I would just um, relay some questions to you, Hayley, if you could kindly answer them, please. Um, yeah, so one, one question is, any stats on re-rupture post-surgery? Yeah, there's a variety of um, statistics support uh, reported in the literature for re-rupture, and it does vary. Um, putting me on the spot off the top of my head, I don't know the statistic. Um, I'd be more than happy to email it to you when I've um, read the paper that I'm thinking of uh, reporting that. But um, it, it does depend. We, the, one of the issues with ACL research is the follow-up at which um, grants here in the UK will give us money to continue um surveying patients so a lot of the re-rupture data is taken from elsewhere um i don't have that off the top of my head but i can get the paper up in the background as i'm answering some more questions fab thank you um, and thoughts on open chair exercises post-op yeah good good question and a, a good topic for debate um i'm a bit boring i don't really have a really strong opinion about open chain exercises um i very much base that decision on um case by case basis um and work within what the surgeon is also comfortable with, depending on where they've had their surgery um, and the limitations that they'll put on it. Um, it's very much a discussion. I don't think personally I feel comfortable saying it's an absolute yes or an absolute no. Um, I tend to err on the side of caution early postoperatively and would only really introduce it um, in, in full range sooner than, than 12 weeks where um, the participant is really keen to do so um, and, and meeting that they are, are comfortable with other standards of rehab that I'd be happy with beforehand. So I'm a bit boring and don't have a strong yes or no, but would be happy to have a discussion about that if if needed. OK, and what are the factors resulting in re-rupture rates? Uh, so that's not research that I've uh, currently done. So that'd be something I have to go and look back into because that's not uh, been included in the work I've done so far. OK, and in the interviews, what did people find the biggest difference between information provided the physio versus consultant? Um, in the experience, the physios can be more cautious whilst consultant can be more progressive. Yeah, good, good question. So um, in the interviews, mainly the differing advice was where um, consultants had listed for surgery, they'd gone to physio um, and the physio had suggested that that person wasn't a typical candidate for surgery. So, i.e. they didn't do cutting or pivoting sports um, and they were having surgery for slightly different reasons. Um, and this, the physio had questioned whether surgery was necessary for that person. But there were also instances where um, patients had got a, a recommendation from the surgeon, either surgery or not. They weren't happy with that recommendation for their own personal preferences. So you saw a second opinion from a surgeon that said something different and then a physio that either backed one of the two up. So um, there wasn't an overwhelming response to sit in one camp or the other where consultants were saying one thing and physios were being more cautious. Um, it was either they said the opposite thing 
nobody was given a recommendation so they the patient didn't feel like they got a, a recommendation from a clinician whether that was a physio or a surgeon or they were told things like um if you want to go back to doing any sort of sport then you have to have surgery so they didn't really feel like it was a decision that was presented to them because they were like well obviously i want to go back to engaging in physical activity um so there wasn't a huge overwhelming difference of physio versus consultant advice okay thank you and what's the recommended prehab time prior to surgery uh, so there isn't one that's a really good question um there is some consistencies with the strength training literature that a three-month period is sensible to help settle swelling um, improve strength with a good strengthening program but there isn't a uh, recommended time frame the recommendations that i mentioned from phil bay um, talk about uh, physical and mental preparation for surgery and the consensus um, study that we've just completed as part of phase two is going to look at some recommendations uh, okay and what's your opinion on outcomes operative versus non-operative acl management uh so i'm not 100 percent sure what you mean by my opinion um so happy if you wanted i don't know if it's possible for you to put your mic on and, and explain but um of course it will be season. So let me just ask to meet. Hi, Hayley. Hello. Hi, it was just the opinion that we've had. Um, a, a young girl that's a P teacher that uh, does netball, ruptured ACL and has been advised not to have reconstruction, which I find quite strange when she does skis, plays netball, and is a PE teacher, but has been advised by both the NHS physio and the consultant not to have surgery. Yeah, good, good point and good question. Um, I think because there on it's not really clear cut in, in my opinion in the literature as to whether somebody should have surgery or not I do, I do think it then makes it a difficult conversation in those situations um I think my uh, my recommendations are always individual case by case basis um in the sense of things that factors are different aren't they depending on the patient so like you say they do cutting and pivoting sports they're really active um it'd be interested to know why the recommendation against surgery was was made and again that was something that i was finding in in my own clinical practice it was um how i what what came out of the phase one interviews with patients that was more of a problem than i originally thought it was or it confirmed some of the thoughts that i'd had in the where, where do these recommendations come from and, and how do patients understand them and, and accept them and challenge them and, and is there that ability to do so? So that's why the shared decision-making tool hopefully is, is developing um, out of the phase two study that we've just done to help in those situations, to open those conversations and, and challenge the idea that a patient just gets told what, what they can have and they're not really happy with it. Um, but yeah, really good question. And I think I'd be interested to know and be a fly on the wall in those discussions, wouldn't it? Yeah, um, I mean, so I just think from a point of view of the, the the person that came to see us privately, she's now got a negative thoughts about not having the surgery because, oh, yeah. because of the sports that she does. So I don't feel she's going to have a, a good outcome because she's already psychologically doesn't think it's going to work because she wants to ski, she wants to play netball and hill walk. And she's a PE teacher, so it's a career. And she feels mm. the best outcome is to have surgery. And I just wondered how many were going non-surgically and what the outcome, if there was any evidence to show that the outcome was going to be better from non-operative. 
Yeah, I mean, the most up-to-date evidence we've got in the UK is the ACL SNAP study that was published in The Lancet last year, um, which did show that at 18 months, surgery had superior outcomes to non-surgery. However, the rehab arm of that trial, um, it was a pragmatic decision for the rehab. So um, I think it stipulated that you had to have six sessions over a three-month period. There was no detail about what that rehab um, entailed. So it's difficult to say whether patients in the non-operative arm had sufficient rehab. There was also crossover of um, about 50% of patients from the non-rehab arm into, into it from the rehab arm, sorry, into the surgical arm of the trial. So the and, and I think that is one of the issues we do lack that longer term follow-up of those patients who haven't had surgery to understand whether that is a, a, a viable option for them and the literature around patients' thoughts about their treatment in ACLs and in the wider MSK literature. Um, and in the predictors review that we did, that looked at patients' estimated ability to return as being one of the predictors of returning to their physical activity. So, yeah, it's a really key thing. And like you say, if their mindset is, you know, they think what surgery is what they need, shared decision making as defined by NHS England is you know, the, the patient's preferences and thoughts about treatment as well as the evidence. And I wonder whether there is an imbalance in those discussions mm -hmm. on that sometimes. Right, thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, um, our next question is, when do you, when do you, when do your outcome measures and which ones do you prefer? How do you yeah. measure your strengths? Yeah, it depends, again, on the hospital and the protocol that is in that hospital um, as to and the equipment available as well. So the consensus study we've just done included clinicians um, from a few different hospitals to try and kind of combat that. Um, in terms of which ones I prefer, that's a really good question. I prefer terminology around return to physical activity um, than return to sport because I think it encompasses a wider range of people. I'm also really interested in return to work with this patient group. Um, and I think following them up until they've returned to their goal, or at least worked through with them if they've not returned to their goal, why that might be, um, is, is a good place to start. In terms of measuring quad strength at uh, my trust, we have a BT machine, um, but we also obviously measure it functionally as well and put that picture um, together. And I've just realised my screen has gone incredibly dark. Um, so apologies, apologies for that. I think the lighting's starting to drop. <laughs> um, is age a factor while recommending surgery? Uh, one of, I think. Yeah, definitely. But not uh, the only, only factor that's important. Um, that was something that we didn't look at in our predictors review because uh, we were looking at modifiable factors prior to surgery and obviously age isn't modifiable. Um, but there are some papers out there that you could um, that look at uh, age factors in terms of returning to physical activity after ACL reconstruction. OK, thank you. I don't think we've got um, any more questions. If anyone's got um, a question, please write in the chat or um, raise your hand and I'll meet you soon. Um, whilst I was waiting for Susan to put on her mic, I found the yeah. paper that I was uh, thinking about for the re-rupture rate from the question from earlier. Um, and 7.8% uh, was the re-rupture rate that I have got from um, the paper that I was using, which is when my reference management loads. Um, apologies, it's decided to freeze on me. I think I'm doing something else. Um, it was a study from 2022. I just can't remember the name of the first author. It was Gupta that I got that from, and the paper was Re-Injury After Successful Primary ACL Reconstruction um, from 2020. OK, thank you, Hayley. Um, I think that brings this webinar to a close. So Hayley, thank you so much for joining us to, um, today and giving your presentation and answering all the questions. It's very much appreciated. Thanks very much. And thanks everyone for joining despite the uh, sunny weather. Very much appreciated. And um, if anyone's got any questions or anything else they want to talk about, then feel free to drop me an email or a message on Twitter and I will get back to you. Mm -hmm.